Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker. It's Claudio Raiku from Notre Dame, and he'll speak about commutative algebra with something invariant monomial ideal. SN. SN. Claudio, Claudio. Yeah. Well, I hope everybody's doing well. I'd like to thank the organizers for putting this seminar together and for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about monomial ideals. Uh, and so let me start with establishing a little bit of notation. So for me, K is going to be a field. And S will denote a polynomial ring in N variables denoted E1 up to EN. So I choose this notation so I can write a monomial as E to the X. This is a typical monomial. And, uh, and X just denotes the exponent. So um, what I want to look at is, is the following problem where I fix um, a subgroup G inside GLN and let it act on the polynomial ring by um, a linear change of coordinates. And there's two natural problems to uh, consider in this setting. Uh, the first one would be a classification problem. So just classify uh, all the G invariant ideals. in the polynomial ring. And problem number two, once um, you have a classification, you just pick any invariant ideal. So given any such ideal i uh, to describe um, basic invariants. Uh, associated to uh, uh, I. And so I'll put a list down and but you can feel free to add to the list. So I want to look at the uh, uh, Castelnovo map regularity. Or uh, uh, projective dimension. Or you know, Coy Macaulay property, um, Betty numbers, and so on. Okay, so these are uh, um, basic um, questions to ask when you consider um, ideals with some symmetry. And the uh, uh, goal for today is to look at one example. So my group G is going to be a semi-direct product of uh, the n-dimensional torus. Uh, and I'll let this act on uh, the polynomial ring by um, coordinate rescaling. And this uh, Sn or sigma n is the symmetric group. Uh, which acts 
by uh, permuting coordinates. So I said this is a subgroup of uh, GLN, so you can realize it concretely. Uh, as a group of uh, generalized permutation matrices. So what this means is that these are matrices where uh, each row and column contains exactly one non-zero entry. Okay, so, you know, for instance, this would be a three by three generalized for permutation matrix. The torus would be just the diagonal matrices. And then um, the symmetric group would be the permutation matrices. And um, so one remark you can make right away is that in this context, G invariant ideals Well, they have to be invariant under the torus action, so this would be monomial ideals. And they have to be um, also invariant under coordinate permutations, and that's where the SN invariant comes from. So these are the uh, ideals that uh, I was referring to in the, uh, in the title of the talk. Okay, so let's, let's start with the most basic um, example of such ideals. So you fix an integer p from one to number of variables and uh, let the uh, following ideal jp be generated by all the square free monomials of degree p. If you look at products of variables, distinct variables, p of them. It's monomial, it's um, invariant under the coordinate permutations. And in fact, turns out that we know a lot about this idea. So, uh, well, a square free monomial ideal, so it's equal to uh, its radical. And these are, in fact, the only um, G invariant ideals that uh, are radical. Uh, if you look at the zero locus of uh, the ideal JP, so I'll just denote that by, you know, the variety defined by JP. This is going to be, I'll just call it ZP minus one. And it's going to be the union of all the P minus one dimensional coordinate planes. So in particular, is going to have uh, dimension uh, p minus one. So you can compute the Betty numbers for instance, using uh, Huxter's formula. Um, it turns out that these ideals um, um, are very nice. They have the Quam Macaulay property. They have a linear um, free resolution. Um, so I mentioned regularity and projective dimension. If you don't know what they are, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to the actual definitions later, but let me just say 
just trying to convince you that we know a lot about the invariance of these ideals. So the regularity is P and the projective dimension is the number of variable points P. Um, so I said it has a linear resolution. Actually, I've learned from Adam Booker how to see this really quickly. So uh, one thing you could do is you could form the following matrix where the rows are just the variables. So you repeat the variables uh, p times, so you get a p by n matrix. Uh, and then you just throw in some random coefficients. And you look at the uh, maximal minors, so this would be the p by p minors of this matrix. And that's your ideal JP. And the, so the, the minimal resolution is in fact just an egon Northcott complex. associated to this uh, matrix. So of course, uh, throwing in random coefficients uh, is breaking symmetry. So um, I'd like to also keep track of symmetry. And uh, so in particular to understand um, the symmetric group action on the Tor groups and Federico Galetto does exactly this, where he describes uh, the Tor modules for this ideal JP as representations of the symmetric group. And there's other things you could um, you could do so this is about I, I said you can describe the tor modules but there's results of um Mustazza and uh, independently by yaganawa oh, sorry yanagawa uh, which work quite generally for um, um square free monomial ideals and basically tell you that you can understand um, the X groups via the Tor modules in this case of uh, J and minus P plus one, uh, but in general for a square free uh, monomial ideal JP here, you would throw in the Alexander dual on the Tor side. Okay, so we, we really know um, a lot about the invariance of this, um, uh, this square free ideals. And, and if I was focusing on that, uh, I guess the talk would be over now. But I wanna go beyond uh, square free ideals. So I wanna try to uh, go towards the classification problem now. So this is problem number one. And so let me give you some more examples of SN invariant ideals. What you can do is you could start with uh, an exponent vector, any exponent vector, and make out uh, an SN invariant monomial ideal out of it, and just denote it IX. So what you do is you, you write the monomial corresponding to X, and you look at the orbit under the symmetric group action and you get your G ideal. And I'll, I'll refer to this as principal G ideals because up to the group action, there's only one generator. 
And again, these ideals have been studied before. So uh, in the 90s, Bayer and Strunfels Uh, call these permutohedron ideals. They show that when uh, the Xi's are distinct, uh, you get a minimal called cellular resolution. In particular, we know an very well the minimal resolution for these ideals. Um, when they're not distinct, uh, the resolution that you get out of their method is not uh, minimal, but you can still compute the uh, Betty numbers. This was done a little more recently. So we know the Betty table uh, for ge a general exponent vector for these permutohedron ideals, okay? Um, and so uh, let me uh, just uh, make the following easy restriction when I look at this principle of G ideals. Without loss of generality, I may assume that the exponents are non-increasing. And uh, uh, if I assume this, then I can think of the exponent vector as a partition. And I can picture it using a Young diagram. Well, it's best to do this in an example. So if I, Partition just the, the sequence, non-increasing sequence of integers, four to two one. I'll draw it as a diagram of um, left justifies rows of boxes. So the first row would have four boxes, second row would have two, third row would have two, fourth row would have one. So this would be a partition with four parts. The diagram will have four rows. Okay, so um, Partitions classify this principle G ideals, and uh, you can easily check the following exercise. There's a natural ordering on partitions, partial order, which by definition means that part by part xi is bigger than or equal to yi. And in terms of uh, the corresponding G ideal, this is equivalent to a reverse inclusion. Uh, of this form, okay? So that's the structure of principal G ideals and just as a bit of notation that I'll use later. I'll write PN for the set of partitions that classify such ideals. So this would be partitions with at most n parts. So I say at the most because some of the exponents could be zero. And I'll always consider the ordering on partitions uh, described here, partial order. Okay, so I guess uh, now I'm ready to uh, tell you what all the gene variant ideals look like. So let me make a definition. So now I'll, I'll look, instead of a single partition, I'll look at a set of partitions, X. So this is a subset. And uh, I will let IX simply denote the sum of the principal G ideals indexed by this set. Uh, of partitions. And now, again, it's an exercise and this solves problem one. Uh, 
that first of all, every GI ideal has this form. G invariant ideal has this form. Uh, of course, there is a little bit of non-uniqueness here. Different sets of partitions could give you the same ideal. And so that happens uh, if and only if, uh, if you look at the minimal partitions in the sets X and Y, minimal with respect to the partial order that I described earlier, uh, they contain the same uh, minimal partitions. And you can always eliminate uh, because of the inclusion of uh, G principal G ideals that I described earlier, you can always eliminate um, the partitions that are not minimal with respect to the partial order. Okay, and just, uh, you know, just before somebody really complains about this, let me just make a comment to be completely honest. Uh, uh, there's a problem with these statements when the field K is small. And this is the same kind of problem that showed up in Anurag's talk. So uh, these conclusions may fail when this is finite. Just the problem is that the, the, the torus just doesn't have enough points. Uh, in that case, and it's no longer true that torus invariant ideals are monomial. Uh, but really, if you want to um, uh, set this up correctly, then you should either uh, re uh, reduce yourself to the case where k is infinite, uh, or just uh, just think of, of g as a group scheme and consider invariance in that setting. Yeah, but I, th I think maybe the better thing to do, if you want to solve this exercise, is just look at the infinite case. Okay, the kind of invariants that I'm going to compute are going to be just numerical dimensions of some vector spaces. You can always extend the field uh, to compute them. Okay, but anyway, so once you solve this exercise, then you have a solution to the classification problem. And so the the uh, uh, the next thing that I want to do is I want to build towards uh, giving a concrete understanding of, of, of the, um, some of the basic invariants associated with these ideals. And just because I didn't define what I meant by regularity and projective dimension, let me just, just do it in one example. So uh, this would be my, uh, there's one of the two running examples. As I'll refer back to uh, later. So I'll work in three variables and I'll take my set to consist of two partitions. So the first one is two, one, one. And the first, second one would be four, two. So this is two, one, one, and four, two. And so what is this uh, corresponding SN invariant monomial ideal? Well, two, one, one gives me the monomial E1 squared E2 E3. And then I'm allowed to permute variables. So I'll also get Uh, these two other monomials, and then four two is e one four e two squared, and this has six permutations. So this would be an example of a non-principal G ideal. And I, I computed the Betty table using Macaulay 2.
and I found the following. So uh, uh, this ideal has three generators of degree four. And there's no generators of degree five, and there are uh, six generators of degree six. Again, no other generators. And then if you compute the relations and, and relations between relations, you're gonna get this table. Okay, and so uh, what I want to focus on is um, is the width of this Betty table, the, the index of the last column. So this is what's called the projective dimension. And the index of the last row, which is the Casanova mom for regularity. So I'd, I'd like to, to try to understand how to compute this number just from, from the combinatorics of the set X without having to go to Macaulay 2 and, and compute the Betty tables. So that's one thing. And I also mentioned uh, the uh, Macaulay property. That's a little bit more geometric, so I need to, to give you one more exercise before, before defining it. So, um, if you look at the uh, radical of this ideal phi x, then you're going to get a, um, a radical g ideal. So, you're going to get one of the JPs, uh, which one uh, is the one where p denotes the least number of parts. of a partition in X and this set X. And so uh, what that tells you is that tells you that the dimension of this quotient ring, which is of course the same as the dimension of the zero locus of the ideal which is the same as the zero locus of uh, JP and, and as I explained earlier, this dimension is P minus one. Okay, so in our example, and this is an exercise, but in our example, we had the two partitions, two on one, which had three parts and four two, which had two parts. So the least number of parts is P is equal to two. And so that means that the uh, dimension of this quotient ring or the zero locus is one. So this dimension is one, it means what you get is just the union of the coordinate axis in three space. So this is dimension one. Okay. And so to define the core Macaulay, uh, property, so we're going to say that this ideal is called Macaulay. If a certain uh, numerical condition holds that relates the projective dimension and the dimension of the zero locus. So I'll just write it as one plus the projective dimension of the ideal should be equal to uh, the number of variables minus the dimension of the zero locus. So of course, uh, this is just the left hand side is just the projective dimension of the quotient ring. Uh, and this needs to be equal to the co-dimension of the ideal or the co-dimension of its zero locus. Okay, so let's test this in, uh, in our favorite example. Uh, so in our example, uh, on the previous slide, we saw that the projective dimension of the ideal was two. 
So we get one plus two on the left hand side and the right hand side is the number of variables is three and the dimension of the union of coordinate axes is one. So this is clearly false, which means that uh, the corresponding ideal is not comma calling. So again, I would like uh, an easier characterization of this property that doesn't go through computing Betty tables and um, and um, you know comparing um, you know checking this equality. Okay, so let me tell you before I state the theorem. Let me tell you the the general strategy. I'll give more details after uh, the break. Uh, but the strategy to to analyze this invariance of, uh, I said, regularity, uh, projective dimension, and uh, the quantum Macaulay property uh, will be to, to just ignore Betty numbers and instead compute uh, this X modules. And then uh, use the fact that the, the uh, vanishing and non-vanishing properties of these X modules uh, encode regularity and projective dimension. So you can compute uh, projective dimension, for instance, as the maximum index where XJ is non-zero. And for regularity, you also need uh, to analyze the graded components of X. So you would get something like, it's a little more complicated, but the point is that it's completely determined by, uh, by knowing the X modules. So you have to look at XJ in degree R, you want that component to be non-zero. So we maximize this quantity, okay? And uh, so why do I want to ignore Betty numbers? It's because they turn out to be quite complicated, even in this case. So there are, they, first of all, they may depend on the characteristic of the field. So Betty numbers, uh, well, first of all, they're hard to compute. And one reason why they're hard to compute is that uh, her examples of Satoshi Murai, uh, they show that uh, these numbers may depend on the characteristic of the field. However, what I will try to explain is that, that this, this, this other properties that I listed here are in fact independent. the characteristic of K. Okay. So that's um, uh, the general plan. And how am I going to compute um, X modules? So to compute X. Uh, the idea is uh, to break it up into small pieces that are more man manageable. Um, in the following way, so by constructing a filtration, Uh, of the quotient ring S mod I, which is the same as uh, constructing a chain of intermediate ideals here. Oh, which will turn out to be finite. 
uh, and it has the following property, uh, namely that Uh, when you compute x, x of i into s is more or less the same as x of s mod i. So let me just write it. So this is s mod my favorite ideal i x. This is going to be just a, a direct sum of the corresponding x for the mm, mm, quotients in the filtration. What do I mean here by direct sum? Maybe I should put isomorphic and explain what isomorphic means. So this isomorphism is as a graded vector spaces. So only after this numerical invariance that depend on unvanishing, this is enough um, for our purposes. And uh, of course, you, you you replace something that you don't know how to compute with something else. So hopefully, the, the right hand side is easier to understand, and so this is is nicely behaved. So um, it's more manageable. In fact, it can com be computed uh, ex completely explicitly. These quotients turn out to be nice coin Macaulay modules, and we. We, we can compute regularity and projective dimension. We, we, we know a lot. So I'll, I will go into more details and, and, and do an example after the break. But that's uh, uh, the general idea is to break, um, break this complicated X module into pieces that are easy to understand. And uh, uh, maybe one comment to make is that it's, indexing this filtration by the natural numbers is not the best thing to do. Uh, it's better to index the filtration by some uh, uh, set associated to this um, set of partitions X. And let me just tell you what, what's, what are the elements in this indexing. Um, of the filtration, so this is consisting of pairs uh, and what are this Z and L? So the Z is just a, itself a partition and you should think of it as combinatorial data. And you should think of this L uh, which is a non-negative integer as, as some more, some geometric uh, information. In fact, uh, if you match the T's to the pair ZL, then this L is in fact the dimension of the module IT, mod, IT plus one. Okay, so, this, so it is that there will be some, um, auxiliary set associated with this uh, uh, set of partitions X that index a natural filtration for which we can compute um, X uh, for the associated quotients and then, and then that breaks up the original X calculation into smaller pieces. And so let me say the theorem without explaining what this set Z of X is in general, and I'll do that after the break. So what's the, the main theorem? Let me assume that my ideal is uh, not a whole ring to make things interesting. Then you can compute the regularity and projective dimension in terms of this auxiliary set. So, um, even my earlier description of regularity and projective dimension sh shouldn't be surprised by this uh, um, maximization process here. So what you have to do is you have to look at the max of the size of the partition Z plus L plus one as ZL varies into this 
uh, auxiliary set of pairs, and then the projective dimension will have a similar formula where only the L shows up. Okay, and so let's just do an example to see how easy this is to apply. Well, we already have our favorite example where n is three and x is two, one, one, and four, two. So it will be an exercise for you later to determine the auxiliary set z of x, which I only told you it exists, I haven't defined it. Let me tell you what it will turn out to be. So, um, Again, it's a pair, the left-hand side is a partition, in this case it's the empty partition, and then L is one. Uh, then I look at the partition one, one, comma, one. And then uh, there's more data, which we'll have to check later again. So I think there's just six pairs that you get. Okay, so let's compute the size of Z plus L plus one. The size of the empty partition is zero plus one plus one. That gives me a two. Two plus one plus one is a four. Three plus zero plus one is a four. Four plus zero plus one is a five. 5 plus 0 plus 1 is a 6, 6 plus 0 plus 1 is a 7, and this is the 7 that we saw. Uh, it's equal to the regularity uh, of this G invariant ideal. We computed the 7 using the Betty table, and then n minus 1 minus L is, uh, so n is three variables. We look at 2 minus L, so we get 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2. And this, any of these two is just means the projective dimension of the idea. So this recovers uh, the example that we had earlier. Uh, of course, I, I really will need to explain to you how to, uh, to get this auxiliary set. All I, all I wanna say is that this one here uh, just measures the dimension of the ideal. And the fact that you have zeros on the right-hand side is just a, uh, the manifestation of the fact that, that that there will be embedded components at the origin for um, for the scheme defined by the FDI. Okay, so I'll 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 do I'll talk about the filtration in more detail after the break and do a, a smaller example to, to understand how it works. So I think I'll stop for now. All right, so uh, plan now is to to explain a little bit about the filtration and then uh, talk about the quantum equality property, which I haven't yet mentioned. Well, let's do an easier example because maybe this uh, this uh, example with regularity seven is a little bit too uh, big. So let me uh, look at the following: still in three variables. Uh, but let me take a slightly smaller partition. So I'll look at one, 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 and two, two. So what is the corresponding ideal? One, one, one is just uh, E1, E2, E3. There's no interesting permutations. And then two, two, C1, E2 squared, and then two more. Okay, so just uh, can have fun checking that this is the same as the intersection of uh, squares of ideals of linear forms. And the ideal E1, E2, for instance, that's just the ideal defining one of the coordinate axes. So if you intersect the ideals without the squares, you're gonna get the ideal defining the union of coordinate axes and that's J2, but since I'm intersecting the squares, what I'll get is the symbolic square. 
update. So in that case, it turns out that the filtration is uh, very simple. It's just two steps or two interesting quotients. So you have S, you have the symbol X squared, and in between you're just throwing in J2. Okay, and there's uh, two uh, quotients in this filtration, S mod J2, which we already talked about, we understand very well. So let me look at the other one, which is just J2 modulo the symbolic square. Okay, so you can again write this out in full detail. So it has three generators. Let's just look at the first one. So E1, E2. It, E1, E2 is clearly annihilated by the third variable, E3 but it's also annihilated by E1, E2, oops, by the product. And so uh, it turns out that you, you get a direct sum decomposition um, So the next term will be E1, E3, that's killed by E2, and also by E1, E3. And then there's another copy E2, E3. Okay, so, and my claim is that this is something that is uh, uh, easy to uh, understand. So let's just, just focus on the first term, this guy. So I'm modding up by E3, which means that we're basically looking at a polynomial ring in two variables. And then we mod out by the ideal E1, E2, that's, that's an, a copy of J2, but in two variables. So we're looking at the uh, S mod J2, but in fewer variables. And then we're also taking this twist here that just keeps track of the uh, torus weights. So this, this second quotient in the filtration, uh, it's, it's easy to understand if you know uh, how to analyze the, the, the J2. So, so this suggests that uh, we could define in general for any subset lambda one up to N, we can define a quotient S lambda. Uh, so this is uh, just mod out by the variables that are not in lambda. This is the coordinate ring of one of the coordinate planes. And each of these S lambdas has a corresponding ideals JP and fewer variables. And this direct sum decomposition here, I could just write it as a direct sum over all lambdas of size two. There's some twist, which I'll write e to the lambda and then S lambda mod J2 lambda. And the twist doesn't do much and this I, I understand because I understand well uh, quotients of the polynomial ring by the square free ideal JP. Okay, so that's, that's what happens in this uh, uh, simple example. Let me maybe draw this a little bit more geometrically. So there's a there is a geometric interpretation of this uh, this decomposition. So first of all, you can think of each of these um, lambdas, this in indexing sets lambda. So in the first case it was one, two, and then it was one, three, and then it was two, three. That corresponds to a coordinate plane, or in other words, to a point in a, discrete Grassmannian uh, parameterizing a coordinate planes. Of course, that's just a finite set of points. Um, and so you can, what you can 
do is you can, so downstairs you have this union of coordinate planes, and then you have uh, some module, which is this J2 mod J2 symbolic squared supported on this union of coordinate planes. And so what you can do is you can form upstairs a, some universal bundle over this discrete Grassmannian, which is nothing but to every point you associate a corresponding plane. So that means you're looking at three planes upstairs. And in such each plane, you look at the zero locus of the corresponding J2. Well, that's just the union of axes. Okay, so, uh, so then you take the coordinate ring, S lambda mod J2 lambda, and then maybe twist by line bundle, twist by this character E lambda. Putting everything together, you get some module on this universal bundle. And you can just sort of, you can think of this decomposition as just describing this quotient as, uh, you know, there's a map down here uh, to three dimensional space. And, and you should, you can think of this quotient as just the, the direct image of, uh, of this M. And, and this is a general setup. Whenever you're in this setup, there's a way to translate the calculation of X module downstairs uh, to a calculation upstairs. And, and, and it's, it's just a very simple version of growth and duality. So X calculation can be done upstairs. And upstairs, I just have to analyze this S mod J2, which is which is somehow my my input from from the work of many people. Okay. Anyways, that's that's uh, how you can think of, of uh, the quotients that appear in this natural filtration. So what have we done? We have uh, uh, now an S mod J two, and we have J two mod J two squared that we understand well. And they turn out to be some Cohen macaulay modules, dimension one, we know everything about them. And so what, what we're after is, is the quotient S mod, the symbolic square. And so you can form a short exact sequence. So this maps onto S mod J2, and then uh, the kernel is just this uh, J2 mod, the symbolic square. We have a short exact sequence, you get a long exact sequence in X. And uh, well, in this case, there is only uh, one value of J for which the modules on the left and right are non-zero. So this is non-zero only for J equals two. And so that makes the middle guy at least as a graded vector space, the direct sum of the left hand side and the right. Again, what I'm telling you is that uh, if you're careful enough, you could find this um, <coughs> uh, this filtration in general for an arbitrary uh, G invariant ideals. I think knowing that you can do it, I, it's just a little bit of work to, to find it. So let me just give you the recipe um, and then explain a little more about the consequences of this filtration. So there's similar 
filtrations that occur for a general uh, ideal IX. And I said that they're uh, uh, indexed by this set of pairs. And uh, in the simpler example of the symbolic square, when X consisted of these two partitions, the associated set of pairs was empty partition comma one. This just corresponds to the quotient S mod J2. In the filtration and in the second, for just two um, pairs for my filtration, this guy corresponds to J2 mod J2 squared. I already explained that the one means the dimension of the corresponding quotient. And then the partition encodes really the generators of of this module because in J for J2 the generators are the uh, product of two existing variables that's the one one partition so in general of course the question is how do you uh, construct this set C of X so for that you need to establish which pairs um, belong to this indexing set. And so I need a, a little bit of more notation to, to before I tell you um, um, how to do this. So I need to talk about the truncation of a partition. Uh, so you start with any partition in Pn, and then you take some positive integer C. This C stands for the number of columns that you truncate to. And so X of C just means uh, the first C columns. Meaning you draw the diagram and then you pick up the first C columns. So for instance, if your partition was a four two and you truncate to the first two columns, and just that's just a two by two rectangle. Okay, so that's one thing that I need. And I also need to talk about the transpose of a partition, which just means you replace uh, rows with columns. or you transpose the diagram. So if you look at 4, 2, and you transpose it, then you get 2, 2, 1, 1. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you next the recipe for figuring out the pairs, just in terms of uh, uh, the set X. So um, just take any, Partition Z. Okay, we, we fixed um, our indexing set X. Okay, and then we define L to be, uh, oh, sorry, we define C to be Z1. This is just a number of columns in the Young diagram of Z. And this number L, you set it to be the minimum. And with some explicit formula here, where you run over partitions in X with the property that when you truncate to the first C columns, then you're smaller than or equal to Z. And then the, and the idea is that I'm going to put the pair ZL in this auxiliary set, provided that everything goes right. So what can go wrong with this definition of L? 
there's two problems. One of them is that this set over which I compute the minimum may be empty. So let me, let me ignore that case. So if this set happened to be non-empty, And another problem that can occur is that when I minimize this, I can get the value minus one if x prime c plus one is, is zero and I get minus one and my L should always be non-negative. So I wanna get rid of that possibility too. So if this set is non-empty and L is non-negative, then I'll place the pair ZL in this auxiliary set. And, uh, and you can check that this, uh, this happens only for finitely many pairs. So the point is that if, if Z is too big, uh, either the corresponding set is empty or, or L turns out to be negative. Okay, so uh, I guess I took more space than I wanted. So let's do an uh, example. This is the example for the symbolic square. And I will take, uh, you can take any Z you want, but let's just take Z to be one one. Because this showed up as part of one of the pairs. So this partition has one column, so C is equal to one. So what do I do I need to do is I need to take every partition in X and truncate it to the first column. Well, the first one already has one column, so there's no truncation going on. And here I get one, one. And then I need to compare it with Z. So is this smaller than one, one? Well, clearly not. But the second one is indeed smaller than one, one. Okay, so when I look at the formula for L, uh, then I need to look at X, the partition X, which is two, two. I look at X prime one plus one, that's X prime two is the second column that has size two, and this L is the minimum of two minus one. It's just one. So this is why we saw that the pair, this partition and L equals one, was in z of x. And there's only one other pair where you take the empty partition and L is still one. Okay, so it's a fairly explicit recipe to, um, um, to compute this uh, indexing set. And maybe I'll leave this as an exercise to check that the bigger example So check the description of Z of X in, in, in the main theorem when X was two on one and four two. This should be a little more work. Okay, but the point is that it, it's very explicit, okay? So uh, once, I guess I kind of um, told you how you, um, how you get combinatorially this um, index is set. So I'm ready to, to tell you the, the, the next theorem, which is about uh, uh, the Cole-Macaulay property. So let me make the, the obvious remark, which is that since we're working with um, non-radical ideals, so since we allow non-radical ideals, Uh, the corresponding uh, schemes associated to these ideals ix uh, may have embedded components. Okay, and then, uh, and then the next theorem will exactly classify combinatorially when this happens and will be related to the core Macaulay property. So uh, again, I'll take a set of partitions 
and to phrase this, I should uh, ignore the non-minimal partition. So let me assume that this is a set of incomparable partitions. And um, I'll let P denote the dimension of the zero locus plus one. This is so that when you take the radical, you get JP, something we discussed earlier. Okay, and then the following statements are equivalent. Uh, so the ideal is Quam Macaulay. Uh, if and only if uh, there are no embedded components, so we say that the ideal is unmixed. So I think of this as a, maybe a geometric characterization. And how do you test this really quickly? Well, the, the, I think the, the easiest way to to test this is you just look at every x in x. And this needs to satisfy uh, the following condition, the parts in the corresponding partition, x1 up to xp, they have to all be equal to each other. This is certainly something that's easy to check, uh, but you could also phrase everything in terms of the indexing set for the filtration, so every pair ZL uh, satisfies the property that L is equal to P minus one. So I said, I wanna think of this as being more combinatorial interpretations. And uh, this would be more geometric. Uh, and just want to draw attention again at this L. So basically what we're saying, and I'll maybe explain this even better um, on the next slide, is that these uh, Ls that show up in the pairs um, somehow characterize the possible uh, embedded components or possible just components of the scheme associated with Yx. So saying that all the Ls are equal to P minus one, which is the dimension of the scheme, is saying that there's no components that are embedded. And I could add to the list. So for instance, this is uh, this is also the same as saying that the maps from X to local cohomology are um, injective. Um, and this is, you know, it's a, it's a question, you know, in general, understanding when these maps are injective is a question uh, of Eisenberg, Stutz, and Stillman. Uh, which is essentially um, Answered the recent work by Heilong and Alessandro and Ninchuan. So um, I guess in, in in their language, what it says is that these these S mod I are uh, uh, cohomologically full. Okay, so it's, it's a very, um, you know, very concrete way of, of rephrasing the geometry into into a combinatorics in this context of um, SN invariant monomial activities. And again, running out of space, but let's analyze our examples.
So there were two examples, one where x was two on one and four two. And then there was another one which came from the symbolic square where this was one, one, one and two, two. So in both cases, the radical is the ideal J2. So the dimension of the corresponding schemes is one. Uh, but I'll use criterion number three. So if I look at any of the partitions in the first set, they do not satisfy the condition that the first part is equal to the second. So here, two on one, first part is two, the second part is one. So it fails condition three. And that's a really quick way of showing that this is not called Macaulay. If I look at the second example, well, the first partition has first two parts equal to each other. Second partition also has the first two parts equal to each other. So this satisfies condition number three. So this example is uh, called Macaulay. That's going to be true more generally about the symbolic powers of these ideas. Um, JP. Okay, so uh, what we did here was to uh, understand when there are no embedded components combinatorially. So what do you do if you have embedded components? Well, uh, you could try to eliminate it, eliminate them. So uh, how do we remove embedded components? Well, the answer is to use saturation. So if you have one of these G invariant ideals, Ix, and you want to eliminate the uh, components that are supported on the zero locus of Ji, you saturate. So in general, this is easier said than done, but but there's a, a formula to compute the saturation. Okay. Um, so this is still going to be a G invariant ideal. So I, I have to tell you, oops. what is the corresponding uh, set of partitions? Well, all you do is you just remove columns of size at most i from each x in x. Okay, so so this is really what happened in our example. So if you look at this two one one non coin Macaulay example, and you eliminate um, the columns of size at most one, it means you're saturating with respect to the maximal ideal, you're eliminating the components at the origin. And what you're getting is the one, 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 and two, two, which corresponded to the symbolic square of uh, of J two. So perhaps a, a better picture for the uh, scheme associated to the ideal I X would be that there's really this the coordinate axis. Uh, they each appear with uh, multiplicity two. But then, then there's also an embedded point here at the origin. 
Okay, so that's uh, that's uh, in terms of the that's how you compute the generators of the saturation. Um, but then you might ask what happens with the um, or with the filtration when you saturate. And when you look at this uh, set indexing the filtration after you saturate, then what happens is that you're keeping uh, the pairs that you originally had, but only the ones where L is bigger than or equal to I. So this means you're eliminating uh, any modules that had support of dimension at most I minus one, which is the, uh, the dimension of Ji. And uh, again, if we go back to our example, which I haven't verified, but I left this as an exercise, so X is two on one and four two. Um, I remind you that the set of pairs that you get is some pairs with L equals one, and then a bunch of pairs with L equals zero. And so I told you then if you if you want to saturate uh, then all you need to do is just eliminate this uh, modules that were supported at the origin and then you get the set of size two which corresponds to the uh, a filtration with two steps where you throw in the ideal j2 in between s and the symbolic square Okay, so this fits in well with um, um, with the examples that we've uh, we've seen before. Okay, so that these 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 are the uh, maybe the, the the main results that that you can establish in this setting. Once you have this concrete formulas, there are more things you could do. Uh, for instance, you could, um, uh, if you're careful, you can prove that S mod any G invariant ideal is what's called sequentially called Macaulay. Uh, you can look up the definition due to uh, Stanley, but it, it has to do with constructing an appropriate filtration uh, where the quotients are Macaulay and satisfy certain um, increasing dimension. And, and the way you you construct this filtration, I guess a posteriori is by, by just uh, taking this saturations and given what I told you about how saturation works, it will automatically make the quotients uh, or Macaulay of appropriate dimensions. Uh, you could also ask about characterizing uh, which of these G invariant ideals have a linear resolution. And uh, and and the answer to this is is those that are symmetric shifted ideals. Again, I don't want to give the definition. But let's refer you to work a uh, recent work of Biermann and De Alba. Federico Galetto, Morai, uh, Nagel, um, K, 
Keith Romer and Alexander Sicilano. Uh, so they prove they construct this this class of ideals that uh, they are gene variant. They prove that they have a linear resolution. And they ask if there's something else. Well, understanding linear resolution is, is just saying that the regularity is equal to the uh, generating degree. So because there's such an explicit formula for the regularity, you can actually prove a converse and show that every ideal with a linear resolution has to have this combinatorial property. Uh, there's other things you could do is you could look at the regularity of powers and I actually don't know how to compute regularity of powers for an arbitrary G invariant ideal. But if you look at the permutohedron ideals, uh, there is an explicit formula for the linear function that computes the regularity of powers. So the results of Kutkowski and Herzog and Trung say that you're always going to get a linear function. The question is what are these explicit um, coefficients? And, and you can compute them, uh, but to compute them, you have to solve some, some optimization problem because remember, formula for regularity had to do with maximizing some, um, some um, linear quantity over a finite set of points. So it can be quite difficult, in particular, I, I would be interested in understanding more uh, about not just permutahedron ideals, but, but general ideals. And then uh, there's another thing that, that you might want to study, which is uh, you fix your set of partitions, but then vary the number of variables. So this ideals, you could look at them inside bigger and bigger polynomial rings and then try to understand what happens with the regularity. And it turns out that this is, again, a linear function and it's linear in N. Um, for instance, Satoshi Murai proved this by analyzing the Betty numbers. You could prove it by looking at the formula for regularity. Uh, and, and this fits in with a, a, a general question um, of Lee, Nagel, Gwen, and, and Romer, whether when you look at sequences of SN invariant ideals, not necessarily monomial, in increasing number of, uh, of variables, whether you get uh, linear behavior for the regularity. So I think that's still open, but uh, we have at least two proofs in the monomial case. Okay, so let me stop here. Thank you, Claudio. So if there are any questions, you can type it in the chat box, but there is one that is already posted. And the, the question asks about uh, whether what happens when you replace SN with other subgroups of SN and what part of your approach generalizes to that context? That's a very good question. So for instance, I mean, the bit, uh, I don't know, I would like to. Uh, but the, but I, think, I think it would be interesting already just to take replace SN by the trivial group and understand whether such filtrations exist for general monomial ideals. Mm. And I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I haven't been able to produce them. Um, certainly when, for instance, when Mustadza looks at um, X for a square free monomial ideal, he constructs some natural filtrations on the X module, not a filtration on the ideals. But I mean, I'm sure there is some more structure on this X module that, um, that needs to be understood. So this is how far I got. But, but, but I think this idea for considering filtrations should, should give more results. Beautiful talk, Claudio. I had no, no notion that there would be such a theory. So. So and they, complete. Uh, it would be nice if there was something like this for general monomial ideals. I don't yeah, know. certainly it would. I don't know what the chances are, but it would. Yeah. Um, we're going to have a tea room after this, and I'm about to put that in the chat room, the address. Anybody can feel free to join us. Claudio, I hope you have some time. Yes. Uh, Maybe I'll try to log in with my computer so I can see people. Yeah. So... Um, whoops, I wanted to send this to everybody. There it is. So it's now just, just put into the chat the address of the tea room.
It's the same as the one that we was in an email yes, earlier, yes? I think so, yes. Yes. Um, yeah, that was... How, how hard are the proofs of these things? You didn't give much away. Well, not so hard. Uh, um, you, if you know, it, if, if I told you the filtration, I told you the index instead of the filtration. If mm -hmm. I told you the filtration, I think it would be one after me. Very prevalent. Um, so it turns out to be, is there a question? I'm not, I'm not hearing it. Right. So those, I, I think it's time to adjourn to the tea room yeah. in any case. So yeah. anybody who wants, join us there. And uh, that will be great. See you very soon. <laughs>